Good afternoon and welcome to today's energy seminar. Uh, very pleased you could uh, be here to join us. It's my distinct pleasure to introduce our speaker today, uh, Julie Mokarin Ortiz, the General Manager of Energy Transition Strategy and Planning. For uh, regulars at the energy seminar, you may remember Julie Mokarin, uh, who spoke uh, with her then boss, John White, um, here almost exactly two years ago, pre-COVID times on campus in the Vidya Auditorium. Well, two big changes have occurred since then. Uh, one is Julie has now been promoted to John's job, General Manager of Energy Transitions and Strategy and uh, Planning. Uh, she was then, I think, the internal and external climate coordinator uh, within the energy, energy transitions and strategy and uh, planning group. Two is she's added a new name, and as uh, she told us in the pre uh, uh, session, uh, gotten married uh, a year and a half ago, conveniently right before uh, COVID. So she's going to update us now. A lot of you have seen in the news a lot of interesting and exciting announcements coming out of our local. Uh, Energy behemoth uh, Chevron Corporation. Julie is based in the uh, Bay Area, uh, so she, she's going to give it, uh, us an update on all that and more uh, in her talk. Chevron Climate Change Resilience: Advancing a Lower Carbon Future. Julie, take it away. Thank you so much for um, welcoming me back here today. It's um, always great to be uh, at a local school, and really unfortunate that we can't be together in person. Um, but hopefully via yeah, this media, more people are able to attend and we can have a, a lively discussion just like we would have in the room. Um, so as was mentioned, I'm here to talk about Chevron's climate change strategy and our recently uh, released climate change resilience report, Advancing a Lower Carbon Future. This is our third task force for financial related climate disclosure report and the third one that I've worked on. So as you can see here on the front cover, um, this is a, a snippet of the 24 that's on our page, which we'll cover in a few moments, but I'm really excited to share some of the updates with you today. I'm gonna go through some of the external environment that we look at and consider at Chevron, and then pivot into what Chevron's strategy is and how we address um, the energy transition. And so the first thing that I like to start with and really to set the context is that we believe the future is lower carbon. Um, I look at this map on the right-hand side and our team jokes that we have to update it on almost a weekly basis. Uh, the colors in blue signify the countries that ratified the Paris Agreement, which to remind everyone was signed in 2015 and ratified in 2016. And then recently, and over the last couple of years, more and more countries have been adding additional pledges um, to both their NDCs as well as net zero commitments to an earlier time frame than were, was originally outlined in the Paris Agreement. So kind of my shorthand and the way I think about it is that um, the Paris has the uh, commitment to limit global warming to two degrees Celsius or less with an ambition towards 1.5. And the shorthand that we translate that into kind of internally is that uh, two degrees roughly translates into 2070 in the median of the scenarios that are run. And a 1.5 is roughly around uh, 2050. And so when we see these countries in green, these are um, almost all countries that are having commitments towards a 2050 net zero ambition. So looking at this trend and kind of taking this in the macro environment, uh, we track this as well as other policy announcements and technology advancements um, in this advancing lower carbon future. Um, at Chevron, we believe we're a global leader and we're working towards a global net zero to help the world achieve its goals. Um, the chart shown here on the right hand side shows the progress that we've already made in reduction emissions intensity. Um, as you can see in 2016, uh, our emissions intensity for our upstream was in the high 30s and we're already reducing down into the 20s. Uh, we have um, achieved a number of reductions through both portfolio changes and MAP, which I'll cover in a couple more slides, uh, marginal abatement cost curve projects. And we have more identified for the future and then are continuing to invest in innovation and looking at offsets to help on that transition towards a global net zero. We're in the top 25% of oil and gas producers, um, which I can talk about in the question and answer and I'll talk about in metrics section in a moment. We are committed to making our updates to our metrics every five years in alignment with the Paris Stocktake Agreement, 
and we've tied nearly 10% of all employee variable pay to um, advancing on our energy transition strategy and our reduction goals. We believe we have a vital role to play. Um, when we start talking about the metrics and the areas that we're looking at, we try and take our competitive advantage and the strengths that we have at Chevron and help advance in the lower carbon future. The chart shown here on the right hand side is a graphical representation of a number of different scenarios and the ranges of the different energy mixes that they're projecting in the future. As you can see, all forms of energy are needed in the future, with renewables being the fastest growing category. You can see that really what most people are talking about is the pace of change and the amount of change that will happen. But you can see that um, oil and gas continue to make up an important part of the energy future, which is why we focus a lot of our attention on how we can become a more efficient producer. Um, you know, the different types of activities, as I talked about a minute ago on some of the macroeconomic trends and policies like technology, um, influence the pace and scale of this change and the locations in which it happens. Because of this um, really intense focus on a lower carbon future and the net zero commitments that governments are making, we believe that more efficient production um, of oil and gas and really all commodities and all products is needed. Um, oil and gas, and before I get into the space, I wasn't aware of this, is a naturally declining asset, which means that to keep producing at the same levels, you need to have continued investment. And so you can see from the chart on the right-hand side that even under the scenarios under the sustainable development scenarios and other low carbon scenarios, you still need to meet, can, uh, make continued investments into oil and gas production to meet the demand um, in any one of the scenarios that was kind of highlighted in the range of, of outlooks that was shown on the previous slide. So with that and to that aim, uh, we have launched a marginal abatement cost curve process and which I'll cover in a, a couple more slides. We've launched a global methane detection campaign looking at identifying fugitive methane sources to be able to abate them. And we've joined the World Bank's commitment to zero routine flaring by 2030. Covering and now kind of getting to what the 24 signifies that was on the cover side and is on the cover of our report, um, we've set market-based approach to metrics. Um, starting with 24 kilograms of CO2 E equivalent for oil and for gas on individual commodity basis. We have a target for two degrees for methane, along with the global methane detection campaign, as well as a commitment to zero routine flaring by 2030 and three kilograms of CO2 per barrel of overall flaring by 2028. We like to talk about this as a market-based approach. My background is in commodities trading, and I like to think, if I were in the market, how would I determine if the producer that I'm buying for is one of the more efficient producers? So that's why we've set the metrics on individual commodity basis and on an equity basis. So equity means that anything that we have um, a financial interest in, we're reporting our metrics and we hold ourselves accountable for. So that's both things that we operate as well as assets that we don't operate, but we've invested through joint ventures. We also believe that these metrics um, along with offsets should be tradable and verifiable. So that if you wanted to um, take these intensity metrics and be able to verify them or look at them along with your underlying products, you would be able to do that as well. Kind of continuing on what Chevron is doing to advance the global energy transition, uh, we like to categorize our activities and strategy into three areas. The first is lowering carbon intensity cost efficiently, to which we've committed $2 billion for, um, from 2021 to 2028 in carbon reduction projects. Our second action area, increased renewables and offsets in support of our business, has a commitment of $750 million over the same period. And the third, invest in low carbon technologies to enable commercial solutions, um, was just announced uh, that we have a $300 million commitment to our second future energy fund. In the next few slides, I'll cover what each one of them is focused on. So one of the first things that I'm really proud to talk about that we helped design was our approach to the marginal abatement cost curve project. What this has done is identified more than 100 projects of reduction opportunities. And when all of these um, $2 billion of projects are funded, we expect them to produce more than 4 million tons of anticipated reductions. 
what the marginal abatement cost curve project does is it takes a number of opportunities that you can see shown on the right hand side of the portfolio opportunities pie chart and, and maps them against one another so that you can compare each one of the opportunities to one another. For those of you not familiar with the marginal abatement cost curve, the width of each bar represents the volume of abatement or reductions available. And the height of each bar represents either the NPV on a per ton basis or sometimes the break even carbon cost per ton. What this allows us to do is use um, standard portfolio theory and efficient investment frontier theory to allow us to select a range of opportunities while maximizing for um, returns and lower carbon, which is the tagline of the company right now. In addition, we're advancing, as I mentioned before, uh, through a global methane uh, detection campaign. We're partnered with the Environmental Partnership to identify best practices on managing methane. Um, and we're investing in a number of technologies to reduce methane and, and detect methane. In addition, we're also partnering with flaring reduction partnerships, such as the Oil and Gas Climate Initiative, the Global Gas Flare Reduction Partnership, and recently, the World Bank's commitment to zero routine flaring. All of these are, are examples of partnerships that we believe are necessary to help advance the energy transition and a lower carbon future. On our second action area, increased renewables and offsets in support of our business, um, we're focusing on things that can help continue to lower the intensity of our business, as well into markets that are policy enabled that are calling for additional fuels, such as renewable fuel partnerships and opportunities that we see here in California. For example, a couple of them highlighted here are efforts on renewable natural gas. In addition, we're looking at other sectors such as the marine and aviation sectors and really how we can partner to advance lower carbon fuels and activities in those areas, as well as scaling and offsets. Um, right now, offsets or credits uh, from uncovered sectors are an important part of the market, but you need standardized contracts, rules, accounting systems, making sure that you're not double counting, double claiming, you have corresponding adjustments, and all these activities, um, kind of the backbone of the activities that go to enable Article 6 in the Paris Agreement. We're partnering with a number of organizations such as the World Bank um, and IHS Market to really bring standardization to these initiatives and to these areas. On our third action area, invest in low carbon technologies to enable commercial solutions. As I mentioned before, we've committed another $300 million to our future energy fund. This brings our total commitment to more than 500 million to our venture capital funds um, for future energy solutions. We focus across the value chain of our d, &D our research development and deployment, all the way through commercial opportunities. And again, we believe that partnerships here are key. You can see that we have a number of partnerships both um, in the United States and internationally, and we're deploying these technologies in our operations to try and advance uh, commercial scale of opportunities. Our focus areas for, uh, for our low carbon technologies are carbon caption utilization and storage, hydrogen and emerging power like novel geothermal. One of the things that I think is especially important to cover when talking about the energy transition is that we're also advocating for just transition. Um, in the back of our climate change resilience report, which hopefully some of you have had a chance to look at, we have one page tear out sheets that talk about our different advocacy positions. Um, Chevron supports well-designed climate policy, global engagement, research and innovation to bring down the green premium, performance base that are tied back to things like our metrics and transparency to enable decision-making. Just to cover a couple of the items that are on the page, things like uh, well-designed climate policy, you can see here, even though it's small, still a graphical represent representation of the marginal abatement cost curve. While we believe that carbon pricing should be the backbone of, kind of great climate policy, we also believe that support for innovation to help reduce the costs and bring forward some of the opportunities like carbon capture utilization and storage are necessary to help bring them into the suite of opportunities that could be incentivized by carbon pricing. In addition, we recognize that there's some activities that may need um, directed policy support. For example, a lot of building efficiency codes where you have a um, market failure or an agency problem where those that have to pay for the reduction or that are investing in the um, potentially uh, 
profitable activity or the, an activity that may pay for itself aren't necessarily the ones that receive the benefits of it. So for example, when I mentioned building codes or building standards, um, an owner may invest in the reductions, but the renter or the tenant may receive the benefit. So in things where there are mismatches between um, those types of situations, we also believe in targeted policies. As I had shown before as well on transparency, we support the well-designed emission reduction metrics to try and incentivize efficient production and transparent reporting um, across our sector and others to go towards value chain emissions reporting. So on kind of highlighting that point and where I'll spend a couple of minutes is really to talk about how we aim to lead in transparency. One of the things that, uh, that we cover on this slide is that we're working towards footprint our products up to the point of sale. We, when we think about um, the activities which we have potential to influence or control, we can think about the actions in our value chain that are upstream of us. By having the information available, the way that we've set our metrics, for example, it enables customers along the value chain to make decisions about the goods that they purchase. To help with that, we're working with a number of partnerships and external organizations to help set accounting standards, methodologies, protocols, and platforms where this can become um, more scalable. And we're working our, with our customers to help deliver those solutions. For example, one of the activities that we're working with uh, organizations is the World Business Council for Sustainable Development's Pathfinder Initiative. We're working with other companies to help standardize carbon footprinting methodology that can then be verified and certified that can then be transferred along customer value chain. We signed and announced our first agreement with Pavilion Energy in Singapore to deliver a long-term contract of LNG that's carbon footprinted. We're working with them now to develop that methodology to make it transparent so that they know the intensity of the cargoes that they're buying. We're also working on helping scale offsets, as I mentioned before, with things like the task force for uh, scaling voluntary carbon markets, as well as um, AIDA on trying our trade organization, which is helping advance nature-based solutions and really scaling both the funding and opportunities to help nature deliver solutions to the energy transition future in our lower carbon path. We also support company level transparent reporting. In the back of our climate change resilience report, in section five, you can see all of our emission reports information reported both on a company level by each segment on both an operated and on an equity basis. In addition, we lay out the formulas for assessing our metrics and a number of other footnotes that we think are useful to our stakeholders to understand how we're reporting our emissions, how they can compare them to other companies that um, may be similar and how they can combine those elements to make the calculations or make the comparisons that are useful to them. As I had started off the presentation by talking about, we also believe in comprehensive reporting, having done now three task force for financial related climate disclosures. So kind of um, closing out on this slide and really what the majority of the presentation is, I wanted to leave a lot of time for question and answer. Um, really all of this comes together to say that we believe in transparency and working with partnerships to help advance the, future, the lower carbon future. Um, as I've mentioned on the climate change resilience report, we have about 65 pages in our report, but if that's too much for people, we wanna make it available and consumable in different formats and ways as well. We have an executive summary that's roughly 10 pages, as well as a brochure that highlights our role and some of the key facts and information. With that, it looks like we have some questions in the poll, so I'd like to open it up for the discussion period. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Julie. Uh, that was a terrific update. Uh, so um, you can see the questions, uh, uh, members of the audience, please submit any questions you might have. We have quite a bit of time for questions now through the Q&A portal. I'd like to start with, um, as you can see, there's a, a bunch of questions purporting to uh, say that what you uh, have been talking about is inconsistent with the quote, new science of climate change. My understanding of that, if I do understand it is, people who read, uh, Trust reports, not the actual IPCC reports, believe that uh, we must get to zero net emissions within a very short period of time, perhaps 10 to 20 years, or there will be uh, major consequences 
I think if you read the report, that's actually not what the reports say concomitantly, uh, and this is probably something that you're in a, a good position to talk about. Uh, there is a presumption based on reading another uh, uh, work group report, namely work group three, which I've been uh, more actively involved in, that the a cost of getting to zero net emissions within that time period is uh, zero or negative. Uh, I don't think that report says that either. So the, the way I could ask this to you is, what do you say to people that say, you're doing more than you used to, but Chevron and you personally should be doing a lot more? Let me just start with that question. I'm sure you've been asked this question before and will be asked again, but I think just to open things up a bit, that would be a good place to start. Yeah, thanks for the question. Um, so as shown on one of the first slides, um, you know, most major energy forecasts and scenarios show that oil and gas continue to have an important role in the future. And we believe that promoting the most efficient producers is, is the right thing to do. And we believe that we're amongst the most efficient producers. Really transparently reporting on the information so that you can see how companies assess their performance so that you're able to assess it as well, we think is necessary to be able to advance a lower carbon future. In a number of the scenarios, they talk about the, the cost and technologies that will be needed. And in scenario that we've seen yet that advances without things like carbon capture utilization and storage. Things that adva require advanced investment and in skills and technologies that, that we have expertise in and that capitalize on our core strengths. So when we think about all of these, how do we contribute the best? Um, I often tell my team and I think myself, being um, helping advance a lower carbon future doesn't mean that everybody stops doing what they're doing, but how do we promote the most efficient producers at whatever activity that they're doing? And we believe that we're amongst the best oil and gas producers, and there should be a preference and incentive towards more responsible producers. So one of the things that we look at is, you know, that goes straight back into how we set our intensity metrics, how we're reporting transparently, and the types of investments that we're making to help scale some of the different technologies that can help reduce carbon. Uh, as a follow on at, at a more uh, detail level, which you're actually more directly involved in as a company, um, there is a lot of uh, debate now about the role of um, big oil in um, keeping uh, cheap natural gas available. So what is your view, there's three or four parts to this, but what is your view of natural gas as a potential bridge to the future? I, I'm on an NREL advisory board and last week, we heard yet again from them that even the National Energy Renewable Lab, which is out there promoting re renewable energy and energy efficiency thinks natural gas is a, play, a role to play in the short to intermediate term in enabling more renewables to come on to the grid and keeping the grid stable. What is your view on that, either as an individual or a corporate? I don't know which one you want to take first. Yeah, so um, we agree that all forms of energy are needed and that natural gas has an important role to play. Um, you can, you know, obviously we follow the same reports that you're referring to that talk about its need and peaking capacity. We can see what's happened when you don't have um, enough natural gas available or enough energy available. And overall, we're promoting affordable, reliable, ever cleaner energy. And that includes across all forms. So when we set, for example, um, our intensity targets, just linking it back, um, you know, 24 is amongst the world's um, lowest gas intensity levels. If you look at the charts from the IEA or others that we've been able to find. And so continuing to promote on not uh, relying that natural gas or that any one form of fuel will always be needed, but how do you continue to innovate and promote lower carbon intensity across your value chain and across your assets um, as part of our core strategy. So the next one in this track is, uh, what is your view on the outlook for CCUS? And even a question, specific question on, do you provide or can you help facilitate the provision of offsets in that regard as a company and an industry? Yeah, so as mentioned, CCUS is viewed to be um, needed in all, all low carbon scenarios and net zero scenarios. 
Um, so we believe that we have competitive advantage. We have one of the world's largest carbon capture uh, storage projects in Australia, in Gorgon. Uh, we also are invested in Quest in Canada, and we're working on advancing CCUS um, more broadly. Of course, uh, as I mentioned in kind of the policy support, we were active in helping uh, pass and, and extend 45Q credit in the United States because we believe that you can need continued investment to try and bring these technologies forward. Um, some of the things that are with CCUS is that they're uh, large projects that take a, you know, a number of years to develop, permit, scale, and implement. But we believe those technologies and really the private-public partnership that is happening to support it is what's needed in the future and that we look to be a part of as well. You can see a number of places where governments and industry are coming together um, with industry hubs or clusters to try and bring use cases for CCUS as well, together with uh, the where the emissions are or the CO2 is available. So you can see some things um, where like our investments in Blue Planet that are using the mineralization to try and improve concrete or things like um, the partnership that we announced for Mendota, California that are looking at bioenergy with CCUS and in Central California. So we believe all of these technologies uh, are necessary, you know, all technologies and trying to scale the different ones are needed, but there is um, most agree and all of the reports that we're following ask and call for um, more CCUS in the future. So uh, the next step in this is um, the role of hydrogen. I know the oil industry is currently, I think still the biggest producer of hydrogen today. So what is your uh, corporate view on the future role of hydrogen? And within that, um, the somewhat heated debate right now about uh, whether or not hydrogen can be gray for a while and then turn green or needs to be green and only renewable based from the get go. This is probably similar to the natural gas story, I would imagine, but you're the expert in this. Um, so we agree that hydrogen is an important part and a, a potentially very exciting part of the energy future. Um, we tend to not talk about it as much as the colors as really of how do you look at the right opportunities and the right markets and what policies or what opportunities are enabled in those markets to really help um, improve the intensity and cost of hydrogen production. So as you mentioned, the oil and gas industry um, has a expertise in producing hydrogen. We use hydrogen now at our refineries, for example. Of course, you can make it from natural gas and other assets and resources that we have. Um, but really, you need um, continued breakthroughs in technology and advancement, and as well as um, looking at the different use cases for hydrogen and really all fuels. report, We have a, a chart that really shows the trade-offs of some of the different fuels against one another and their use cases. And really what it, what kind of the, one of the main takeaways for me was, is that you still need continued technology advancement and different fuels for different uses. Um, but one of the areas that we are focused on in addition to CCUS is hydrogen. So we're part of the Hydrogen Council in Europe, we're part of the um, fuel partnership in California, and we look for continued opportunities to partner to bring forward hydrogen. On that one, what is your uh, view on the role of hydrogen in the transportation sector? Uh, meaning, uh, I think electricity now seems to have an advantage in many places for light duty vehicles, but not yet for heavy duty vehicles, not to mention marine and uh, air applications. Do you have that market segmented in your own mind at this point? Uh, we look at a number of different use cases for hydrogen. I mean, I think when I, back to when I joined the company, uh, we were uh, one of the first companies that had a number of hydrogen stations around California. And one of my first projects was actually helping decommission those those stations because we were a little bit out too far ahead of where the technology and where the market was. Um, I think there are still a number of opportunities where hydrogen makes sense even in the passenger segment. For example, long, long distance commuting or long distance road travel, it can offer a solution. Of course, we're looking at it as well in heavy duty and additional sources like marine, which are still, um, I'd say early stage at this point. Um, but I think that continuing to look at it and seeing that it can have a role in transport um, is still part of our frame. 
We had a follow-up question. I'm sorry I got this out of order, but how big is your U program within your CCUS thing? We've had some interesting entrepreneurial lab talks on kind of advanced uses of, of uh, uh, carbon to even make more, uh, more sustainable life cycle uh, fuels and whatnot. Uh, do you have a big uh, interest in that or, or, you know, set of investments in that area, the use side of the CCSU uh, panoply of different uh, uh, technical technology strategies? Yeah, so the utilization part is really interesting. And I think it's an area that a lot of people are looking, Chevron included, really looking to scale and increase investments in. Uh, as I had mentioned, um, Blue Planet earlier, we also have uh, one of the most exciting areas is around the use even for conversion of proteins. We have a program, a company that's part of our Catalyst program to help advance that called Nova Nutrients. Um, on the utilization side, currently the largest form of utilization, as many people may know, is enhanced oil recovery. We're looking at um, really beyond that for a lot of the categories that we consider. and think that utilization is a um, perfect marrying of where it can have a win-win for both the producers of CO2 as well as the users to help do things like cure concrete more, more quickly. It's a focus area as well as the OGCI climate investments, which were, we've committed $100 million to uh, the over $1 billion investment funds. So it's an area that you know, I think um, there's a lot of enthusiasm and warranted enthusiasm around and look forward to the advancements that are made in the utilization space. Great. Um, switching to the industrial sector, I know from uh, various studies that uh, if your overall goal is to reduce net uh, GHG or GHG equivalent emissions, some of the harder uh, areas to reduce emissions are in the industrial sector where uh, there is, are a lot of big uh, materials production industries that are using technologies as old as 100 years old. Uh, do you see technological innovation there or offsets in other sectors taking care of uh, offsetting uh, missions that are otherwise very difficult? We have certain um, uh, emissions in the ag sector having to do with um, livestock and uh, uh, so forth. Uh, what is your view on the industrial and agricultural sector emissions? Do you think innovations are required? Or are you involved in R&D on those or offsets or other types of substitutions, say, at the product level? Um, so I mainly focus on um, global emissions, but really on Chevron's and what Chevron's strategy should be. We partner and look at through energy hubs and others, the um, different sectors and how we can partner with them to help reduce um, overall emissions. I think a lot of people agree that the ag sector um, looks like it has a lot of potential and that offsetting can be a way to help um, bring together um, a cross sectoral approach to reducing emissions. Um, some of kind of going back to this concept that I was talking about of hubs, I think that's such an interesting way of looking at where the opportunities may lie and really helping to decarbonize hard to abate sectors. You can look at some activities, for example, um, the way Singapore is really doing it on Jurong Island, where they're trying to bring together a number of different sectors, pilot new technologies, identify the needs, um, go from all the way from research and development, all the way through commercialization, piloting some of the first projects and really creating the environment for business as successful ways of doing it. So when we look in through, for example, um, what we're invested through our, our um, technology venture group through the OGCI Climate Investment Fund, again, looking at those hard to abate sectors is also one of the key focus areas there. And I think more technologies are continued to be needed to address um, emissions from uh, kind of the wider industrial sector. And I wanna go back to as well as really highlighting and thinking about uh, this concept of the marginal abatement cost curve and where are emissions, where do they come from and what's the most economic and viable way to reduce emissions in the future. Um, I think that it's important for each sector and each company really to know what their suite of opportunities is. What are areas that need increased investment? What are opportunities that are viable now? What are the barriers that exist to prevent um, those projects from happening? 
And how can you collaborate with other interested parties to help advance a suite of opportunities and really um, find the solutions that work for a multiple um, group of companies or multiple sectors to help advance? So some of those areas, for example, you mentioned offsets. Crediting between sectors is, is a way that the each sector can actually collaborate with others to help advance. Um, and you can see that in situations like under cap and trade scenarios where you can, um, the credits are fungible between different industries and you're really trying to help incentivize reductions across the entire value chain and across the economy um, to its most efficient use. So uh, shifting gears a little bit, but not too much. Um, I was in, uh, impressed and in, in, uh, intrigued by your uh, mentioning it uh, many uh, points in your prepared remarks, uh, increasing transparency. So I guess your argument would be more transparency leads to greater knowledge and understanding, and is really a um, enabler of taking decisive action in the corporate sector, private sector, NGO sector, and whatnot. One thing that's intrigued me the last 10 years, um, which you had mentioned in your abstract, um, is the engagement in the last, over that period of the financial community in climate change. So I wonder what your impression of that is in your experience in uh, working on uh, issues brought to you through the a task force on uh, climate financial disclosures and the, net, the subsequent uh, subsequent uh, network agreeing the financial system and other like initiatives. I think those are pretty major. They also, in a way, increase transparency, not just to the public at large, but to your yours and all other corporation uh, shareholders. What is your view on that? Or, or is it a good thing, bad thing? How are you trying to work with them or are you working mostly with them or against them? Uh, how, do, how do you look at that whole uh, set of interactions, which I think has been a pretty major and hopefully desirable uh, mega trend the, the last 10 years? Yeah, if I, if I think back to some of uh, when I started at Chevron a little bit more than 10 years ago and the number of questions that would come from the financial sector or the the active investors compared to what it is now, it's completely different. And it's a trend that we welcome. Um, as I'd mentioned kind of throughout the presentation, really partnerships and everyone working together and collaborating to figure out how do we advance a lower carbon future is needed. And our stockholders are some of the, our most important stakeholders. Uh, we talk about in our climate change resilience report that we have a dedicated ESG engagement team that is um, nonstop meeting with our financial sector um, stakeholders and aims to meet with our top 50 investors each year. Um, I support them in some of the engagements when we wanna talk about uh, energy transition, especially the climate change resilience report. And I think the, the conversations have really um, evolved and are, are quite sophisticated now where companies are, um, and investors are wanting to model individual companies and look at their performance, which goes back to um, how we've designed some of our metrics uh, on really making it so that you can tell what our performance is on the commodities that we produce and that we believe are our core strengths um, currently, and also on how we design the metrics tables at the back of the report. I know um, I often joke that, you know, um, talking about accounting isn't exactly people's most favorite dinner topic conversation, but really the accounting around carbon and um, disclosures around it, um, disclosure tables on each individual sector or the gases or gloom removal potentials, these are all incredibly important things so that when you're either investing in a company, um, when you personally or through a fund, or when you're buying a company's products, you're able to assess the performance. Uh, there was a, a really interesting podcast that I listened to recently. And I think, wow, I work in this as my full-time job. And it said, how many, um, what do you think the carbon footprint of your tennis shoes are? And, and I thought, wow, like, I don't know the answer to that. I mean, I have a ballpark estimate, but really just thinking about how we've evolved as a, I often use a shorthand reference of, it's like we're trying to go on a, a low calorie diet without knowing how many calories are in any, any, in any of the foods that we eat. It's really hard to make assessments. And so whether I look in my personal life or us at Chevron, really trying to assess, well, where do the emissions come from? Where are the abatement opportunities? How much does it cost? Where is my best option either as an individual or to help the company assess where, um, 
where do we put our efforts and in, um, investments into to help a, a lower carbon future? But circling back to really kind of the engagement with the financial sector, I think it's been extremely productive. Um, who would have believed, you know, a number of years ago that ESG funds would be um, kind of the, the very uh, dominant or very uh, popular funds that they are now? And I think it's an exciting trend. So I think, though, that kind of advancing on that and going back to the transparency comment, you really need this level of transparency from companies uh, and the financial sector is also working on it for their own sector to assess their portfolios is needed to help society um, overall understand kind of the individual carbon footprints we have and of the activities that we participate in. Great. Uh, now, uh, on the way to getting a little bit more contemporary political, um, don't worry, not too pointed at that rate. I was pretty um, pleased to hear because I found them amazingly uh, active and um, impactful these days with the World Bank Group. Uh, for a while, I thought they were kind of doing more abstract uh, things, uh, largely uh, stimulated by interactions with academics like me, but now they seem to be much more action oriented in this space of trying to get all the uh, stakeholders together. Uh, and we're trying to do a little bit more on this uh, at Stanford, as you probably read. Uh, so that's one element, but I guess what I wanted to get to, because we don't have too much time left is, I imagine you and the company at large is in uh, active discussions, both with the Biden administration in DC and given your location in particular uh, with the Newsom administration here in California, which is trying to go much faster on this than, than the federal government. So what has that set of interactions uh, been like and where do you see problems and opportunities? There was even a, a perspicacious question uh, by the audience that I think would be an interesting thing. Could you do a carbon capture and sequestration demo or even a, a commercial project within California in the near future. What, what is your view on that whole range of issues? Yeah, so we work with governments around the world on trying to help advance um, lower carbon future and also the policies that will help support that. We were one of the companies that helped support the extension of the cap and trade in California a number of years ago. One of the first things that I worked on when I came to the company was on the low carbon fuel standard. So I'd say that there are lots of opportunities. Each region and kind of uh, geographical area offers its own suite of opportunities and different solution set. Um, you know, going back to what I talked about originally on, on carbon pricing really being the base and really having this transferability between sectors is so important to help find the efficient solutions and collaboration between sectors, um, which is why we put a number of these policy one pagers in our report. Um, we look at uh, you know, CCS in a number of different uh, areas and locations. Um, I think we'd be excited to do um, pilots and look at different opportunities. As I mentioned before, what we've already announced on um, looking at the uh, San Joaquin Valley where we have oil production and looking at a pilot, we talk about it um, as CCS pilot. We've looked at some of the capture technologies in particular as well as what I talked about earlier on the Mendota project, which is for bioenergy and carbon capture in the Central Valley as well, um, is something that we you know, would be excited to advance. Um, and then kind of going back to CCUS overall, because of its importance you know, in both the, uh, the reductions that it can help the world achieve, as well as our capabilities in it, is an area that we are looking at in multiple geographies around the world. Uh, so uh, I want to squeeze in a, a couple of questions before my finale, which is uh, basically advice to the young people about what kinds of skills will be needed in the future. And the, the, uh, inter the inter uh, interim questions are regarding uh, kind of here and now rapid action things. Uh, and they are, uh, do you work with or are you interacting with People like the plant-based food industry. I know Impossible Foods has now said they would like to um, make it uh, not uh, the world not dependent, not dependent, uh, taste and policy things um, aside, on uh, animal-based um, protein by 2035, and on the vehicle side, 
uh, you know, back in the, the oil embargo days, there was this kind of cash for clunkers. Are you engaged with any, any um, auto industry groups of any type to try to facilitate what I would call, what, what the questioner called stock turnover rates to get more people buying EVs or hydrogen uh, vehicles to get uh, to a lower level of uh, carbon and uh, therefore greenhouse gas emissions. Yeah, I know um, Chevron in the past when I joined the company was involved in a number of those types of efforts um, on the vehicle turnover and helping even uh, fund uh, repairs to for smog tests um, if there were repairs identified in those. So I think it's um it's an important area and as as you know the question kind of alluded to or addressed is the stock take turnover is one of the reasons why um, there are different forecasts on the scale of uh, and pace of energy transition. If you look at some of the data right now from COVID, for example, um, during the COVID pand pandemic, some of the the um, the asset life is in vehicles in particular is actually um, lengthening during this period of time as people are more reluctant to invest in some of those um, technology upgrades or uh, new vehicles. So it's a, you know, you asked about the plant-based interest as well. I think that's a really um, exciting area. My background before the oil and gas sector was in agriculture. So I'm always hopeful that there's gonna be kind of a joining of more forces. Uh, we have some, uh, the company that I mentioned in the Catalyst program. And of course, in my own personal life, have a refrigerator full of uh, some of those plant-based uh, alternatives. And so I think what it, that's getting to as well is really looking at what are all of the suite of opportunities and solution sets that we can employ as individuals or as companies. And um, I know that Chevron is looking and uh, continues to look at partnerships and really working with others as the best way of advancing a low carbon future. So I'm going to... Uh, actually read a very timely question from an audience member as a lead into your up close and personal with the student following your uh, seminar. And that is, what is your view regarding people and skills to lead this transformation? What is missing today and what will be required within the next three years? I guess both at Chevron and for the world at large, since you're uh, right in the middle of this uh, you're kind of where the rubber meets the road on this. So what kind of people would, do you wish there were more of, and do you think both uh, in your engagements within and outside the company? Yeah, so I joined Chevron 13 years ago and have been working on energy transition topics for the entire time I've been at the company. From both um, the trading perspective and with our trading group, to our technology ventures group, to our long-term strategy group, to now where I sit in corporate strategy and sustainability. And I think that if I um, talk to, you know, I talk to a lot of uh, employees that are new and incoming, people that are excited about working in the space, both internally and externally, I'd say that the, the number one thing, um, probably not dissimilar from what other people say for really anything in life is grit and perseverance. And really thinking about how do we, this isn't a, you know, Unfortunately, there's not, just like most things, uh, an easy solution. Uh, we're talking about kind of, as had been mentioned before, uh, global stock and turnover, um, lifestyle choices, activities, um, systems of change. And those systems of change are very, very large. Uh, you're trying to change an entire system and it requires kind of waking up every day with a sense of optimism and thinking, how do we change the incentives? How do we align the incentives to the future that we're looking for? And how do you keep going um, day after day to look for the technologies, the innovations, the partnerships, um, the policies that can really help advance that? So I'd say perseverance um, really in anything that people are pursuing is uh, one of the things that I hope that people continue to have as we look to advance a lower carbon future. So I'm going to sneak in a uh, sneaky follow-on question. I, I hope you don't mind. And that is, in your 13 years, my impression is groups like yours at Chevron and uh, those similar groups uh, elsewhere uh, have a lot more influence in the corporate boardroom than when you first joined. Would that be an accurate assessment? And if so, you'd probably like it to be moving faster. But do you, how do you think about the pace of change from the inside looking out? Uh, it's an interesting question because when I joined the company, 
Um, and really, if you think about the pace that the industry has changed just in the, the last decade, we went for, from a situation where we talked about um, peak oil, not from a point of, of peak demand, but really from peak supply. So we went from limited supply uh, to limited demand or changes in demand. And that change, I think, has uh, really, and really the pace of change, the volatility of prices, um, the changing environment, of course, now with COVID, all of these paces of change seem to be um, that what they really go to, and it goes to the title of our report, circling back to it, of resilience, is a company that tests multiple scenarios. Um, I didn't cover the kind of the slides in here because um, most people now don't ask about all the scenario tests that we do and kind of looking at the different um, outcomes of those. But we often talk about how do we win in any environment? How do we analyze a number of different situations and scenarios? So I'd say that over the course that I've been with Chevron, I've really seen us continue to advance um, the types of scenarios that we're looking at and really the range and the types of opportunities that people, um, you know, if we were to go back just a couple of years, who would have thought that we would have a, you know, well, I'm sure that there are actually, we've read some books about some of them with, that we're forecasting that we're going to have a, a pandemic. But really some of these things aren't necessarily how do you get this one right or has this energy transitions more popular, less popular, or, or how much more is it advancing? But really how are you continuing to test um, kind of against external views, different scenarios, and really try and inform a company strategy that can um, go with the test of time. Chevron has been around for 140 years, a little bit, you know, plus or minus, and looks to be around for the future. And generally people at Chevron are joining the company because they wanna work on, on careers that have import, important contributions to society and that can last um, an entire career. So I'm one of the anomalies that came in kind of uh, a mid-career transfer over into the company. But I think um, from the time that I've been there, really that uh, focus on the long-term and how do you ensure your resilience toward the long-term is something that I've seen uh, continued from the time that I joined. Yeah, and I'm very glad as a citizen and uh, sometime researcher that you've done that. I, with a soft back to our um, new science people, I think you would agree that, uh, that there is an issue about timing perhaps, but uh, all the new science does say that the need to act is more urgent than ever. So I'm glad mm -hmm. you're on the job looking uh, from the inside out of uh, Chevron. So we thank you for a very uh, enlightening and uh, transparent uh, uh, and um, uh, inspirational seminar. And we hope you can uh, indeed, as you said at the beginning, come visit it here hear us on, on campus soon. You have a short trip to come see us, but I hope you'll be able to be do so in the near future. So thanks once again. And now I'll leave you to the uh, follow-up session with the uh, students. Thank you again. Thank you.